I'm Ari Redford. Welcome to TRM Talks. TRM Talks is brought to you by the leading provider of blockchain intelligence and anti-money laundering software, TRM Labs. Today, I am joined for a really special TRM Talks with the co-host and author of the acclaimed podcast, Lazarus Heist, to talk all things uh, North Korea, cyber, uh, cryptocurrency. Um, Jeff White. Jeff, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Really, really looking forward to the conversation. Um, as you know, uh, you know, we, we've, we've spent a lot of time sort of thinking about North Korea, particularly in the cryptocurrency context. And really, um, with Lazarus Heist, um, I think in many respects, you've sh- shined a light on, um, a really, a, a really true national security threat, um, and, and threat to the crypto ecosystem. Uh, would love to kind of kick things off by just hearing about your journey a bit. How did you find this topic and then really start to sort of really become an expert and and work and, 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 and write a book and, and, and a podcast and, and really that that story? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I came at this from a sort of cybercrime background. So I wrote a book a few years ago called Crime.com, which is everything you ever wanted to know about cybercrime but were afraid to ask. And some of the chaps in that sort of incorporated bits of the uh, North Korea's alleged hacking campaigns. So the attack on Sony Pictures Entertainment 2014, the amazing heist on Bangladesh Bank 2016, and then the WannaCry ransomware attack from 2017. Um, off the back of that, the Bangladesh Bank story is so compelling. It's such a bizarre and intriguing and intricate heist um, that I pitched that to the BBC as a, as a podcast series and then paired up with Jean Lee, my co-host for the podcast. As a journalist, she spent something like six years in and out of North Korea, establishing the first uh, Western News Bureau ever to be created in Pyongyang. I think the first and the only thing I'm correct in saying uh, Bureau. So she sort of filled in the kind of North Korea sides of it. I filled in the sort of cybercrime and cryptocurrency time sides of it. Um, season one of that podcast went out a couple of years ago, I think 2021. Um, I then wrote the book of the podcast, the Lazarus Heist. And then season two of the podcast has gone out earlier this year. I think it went out in April this year and it brings things pretty much bang up to date, although there's a couple of bits that are miffed we didn't get to cover more, but I'm sure we can cover them more in this session. Um, no, no, fantastic. I mean, as I listened, um, and I've, I've been a fan for, for a long time, um, it, it's really the story of sort of, to me, um, just increased complexity and sophistication. Um, would you just sort of talk about how the two seasons maybe sort of how, how you see that journey in terms of North Korea and also how you documented it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, season one, um, we were lucky with season one in that the dust had sort of settled on a lot of those cases. So Sony, Bangladesh, WannaCry, we knew looking in the rearview mirror what had happened fairly clearly. I'd also covered those stories quite extensively. So I knew them in and out. I knew all the twists and turns and, and you know, how it would fit as a sort of story. Um, additionally, we had Bangladesh Bank sued everybody, basically about 40 different people, um, on their, on their uh, lawsuit. The U.S. government, the Department of Justice, put out a 178-page criminal complaint against one of the North Koreans they claim was behind this. So we had a huge amount of evidence, and we were able to sort of put those story blocks together. Series 2 was a bit more of a challenge, I will be honest. North Korea's hackers didn't stop, according to the accusations against them. As you say, it got more complex, more intricate. It pushed very, very deeply into cryptocurrency. So we knew we'd have a bit of a challenge on our hands in Season 2 because the situation was still moving, the story was still moving. We just had to kind of pick our targets and go, okay, we're going to tell that story, that story, that story, and other ones that we could tell we, we are just going to leave out. We've had to sort of cut our cloth uh, accordingly. But yeah, the complexity absolutely um, has increased. And what's really, really stunning and keeps getting me again and again is where a country that for where most people don't have access to the internet, let alone a computer, they are looking at the cutting edge of cryptocurrency. They are they are targeting bits of this industry that even I, as a technology journalist, struggle to understand. Tiny numbers of people on the planet understand how some of this crypto stuff works, including the folks at TRM Labs and others. Um, the North Koreans are hacking it and doing an extremely good job of that. That is that is remarkable, given the country that's allegedly behind this. I want to get back to some of the sort of specifics on the seasons. But before I do that, you, I, I want to sort of stay on that last point. How did they do this in, in, in your, from, from, your, um, from your research, right? I think one of the most fascinating things about this is how a country with very limited resources could create a cadre of, of cyber criminals who uh, operate at this level of sophistication. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, there's a there's sort of lengthy answer sort of spread throughout the series about how this works. I mean, broadly speaking, North Korea as a society in common with a lot of communist societies really respect science and technology and technical skill. Um, so skill in mathematics, skill in computing, 
will be things that were looked out for in the schooling system. As you come up through the school system in North Korea, they are looking for people who are very good at maths, who can spread that skill to computing and science and technology. Um, those people will be streamed into particular streams. Some of them will go on to work on North Korea's uh, nuclear missile program, uh, which obviously is part of what gets into a lot of trouble. Um, some of them will be uh, pulled into the sort of computer hacking and computer uh, industries. Um, it's all run by the government. North Korea is a, is a government-run, top-down, dictatorial society. So they kind of place people where they think their aptitudes are. You, you don't really sort of bum around for it and then apply for a job in North Korea. It's all quite programmed. So it's quite specific, the idea that it's going to be a computer hacking team. And we should put out, I mean, you know, the US, the UK, all governments, most governments now have a computer hacking team within their military and intelligence establishments. The difference, obviously, with North Korea is because the country started to run out of money because of the sanctions on it, its hackers are tasked with going out and earning money for the regime. And that puts them in really, really fascinating territory from a sort of investigative journalist's uh, point of view. In terms of we asked how they do this hacking. I've talked there about how they create the teams, how they actually do the hacks themselves. Depressingly, it's still 2023 and we are still looking at phishing emails. In the vast majority of cases, the way in for these teams is, uh, a fi- I was going to say a simple phishing email. They're often quite carefully crafted phishing emails, but it's still that's still the vector of choice, the, the way in for, for most of the hackers. It's truly extraordinary. We talk all the time about how do you harden cyber defenses? And then you see these all attacks are using social engineering techniques um, so it's education, I guess, but somehow they've really perfected this extremely targeted type of cyber activity. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the key to a phishing email is psychology. You have to understand your target. You have to understand what they're going to respond to. Um, now, what's interesting about that is you need to really get quite up close and personal with your target. If you're going to send them a phishing email, you need to kind of understand the kind of thing they're going to respond to. So again, it's extraordinary for me that North Korea, which is a, a society that's been closed off from the outside world by its leadership, its hackers are still able to get out on the front foot and work out who they're targeting, work out how we think and how people in the West think and what we respond to. We'll come on, I think, to the cryptocurrency stuff. Uh, obviously, people working in the crypto community, what are they going to respond to? So really getting inside your target's head and understanding is key to the phishing email. And the, the fact that North Koreans are able to do that, again, points to the sort of increasing level of skill and ability. It's an amazing point. I mean, the, the, the reporting is that the $600 million Ronin hack, the largest hack ever in the crypto space, was from a job offer in a PDF in a phishing email from yeah. North Korea cyber criminal. For them to understand um, you know, social media, the job interview process, and all of that in that way, I think really speaks to your, your point. Mm. Um, yeah. Really, really extraordinary. And by the way, that Ronin Bridge attack, yes, I, I think you're exactly right. It's the largest in the crypto space. I actually think it's the biggest hack of all time, which is quite yeah. a bold statement to make. Obviously, some campaigns have made way more than that. Ransomware has made billions over the, over the years, over yeah. different targets. But that's just the point. If you're looking at one hit, one target, one crime, one off, I think the Ronin Bridge attack, um, we can go into the details of that, it, it is probably the biggest hack of all time. Um, it, it, it's also, I think, a contender for one of the biggest thefts of all time. Because when you actually start to look around the internet, you start to try and work out, you know, what are the big thefts, the big crimes? 600 million is, is up there. Uh, what yeah. annoys me is it never gets listed. Other crimes and other, you know, famous bank jobs, the Brinks, Matt, Bullion Robbery and the Great Train Robbery, they're all listed. And yet that Ronin Bridge Axie Infinity job doesn't get mentioned. And I, I think it should. <laughs> I really do. It's extraordinary. I mean, I, I, I sort of have seen it's a watershed. Um, I think it, you know, um, certainly um, from global law enforcement perspective, I think crypto crime was seen as, you know, fraud and and, and Ponzi schemes uh, and very much a law enforcement police issue. And it seems to me when Ronin was associated with North Korea in particular, it changed it to a national security issue where you see, you know, in the US, the White House National Security Council and the Treasury Department using sanctions to go after um Lazarus Group and and, and others, um, really just an absolute watershed. Hmm. It's, that's been absolutely fascinating. There's the two sides to it. There's a sort of break in to this video game Axie Infinity and the idea that a video game was sitting on $600 million of stealable money is itself remarkable. Um, certainly, I'd never heard of the, of the video game. And then there's this sort of postscript to it in the laundering side, the crypto laundering side, and the use of this crypto mixer, Tornado Cash. And the argument that's broken out, the debate that's broken out around Tornado Cash, around the use of a mixer, obviously the US government, as you say, a sanctioned not just the North Koreans, but a sanctioned the, the mixer itself, Tornado Cash. And now there's this debate over whether sanctioning a piece of code is actually something that the US government could do, should do. 
it, what does this say about crypto in the future? There's this epic freedom of speech battle coming down the line. It's a battle royale, really, of crypto and freedom of speech. It's going to make its way uh, through the courts, all related to this original hack. It's, it's so interesting to tie it back to that. And that's exactly how you have to look at it. It's really extraordinary. I even go sort of further when I, I was a prosecutor for many years and um, really in post 9-11 world. And all we were focused on was sort of that national security threat. And I think a combination of things like Colonial Pipeline and the Ronin attack really shifted that to a digital battlefield where we have not, we now live in that world. And, you know, questions, but, but questions of privacy versus security that used to happen in airports and city streets now are happening on blockchains with these conversations around Tornado Cat. It's just a fascinating moment. And it's so cool that you're, that I, I think you're focusing on this. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the 9-11 uh, thing because I read a book called Treasury's War. Forgive me, I can't remember the author's name, but it was, did, do you know who it is? Juan, Juan Zarate. That's the one, very good. <laughs> and it's fascinating because it talks about the, the post 9-11 financial battle to try and effectively create good banks and bad banks and, and, and to sort of sort that out. What's interesting is I see in the crypto world with sanctioning with things like Tornado Cash, I do see a similar effort. I, I suspect part of the US government and the Treasury's approach to this is to say, look, there will be good crypto and bad crypto. You know, we can't stop the bad crypto, but we will freeze you out of the system. What's interesting is obviously the banking system, traditional finance, dollar based and the, the power of the dollar. You're now looking at a new world in which crypto is the currency and the dollar doesn't have the power it did. It's going to be interesting to see how that beds in and how that, that is executed. If indeed my supposition is right there and it's a similar sort of tactic going on. It's uh, it's an amazing analogy, and I love the reference to the book. I, I spent um, about two years working in that office, the Office of uh, Terrorism and Financial Intelligence in at the U.S. Treasury Department, um, for the Undersecretary. Several after, uh, you know, that book was written. But I, I will say it's exactly the same people. Like this story that we're talking about right now is a postscript on Treasury's war. Right, we that was very much that nine eleven apparatus that was set up, and now those same offices. Um, you know, FinCEN, uh, OFAC, uh, TFFC, which is the policy shop there, are now working on digital assets mm. and, you know, uh, using sanctions, using other tools. It's a really, really interesting moment. But I think it's interesting. I feel that, and it's something I've put, I've, I've written a book. My next book is going to be about money laundering and technology. So exactly this sort of territory. And one of the things I've put in there is this sense I get from the crypto community that there's a caginess about this because on the one hand, there are people in the crypto community who want regulation, who want to get all of the trust and verification, everything that goes with that. But at the heart of some of the people working in the crypto industry is this sense that they invented this technology. Governments didn't invent this technology. Banks didn't invent this technology. We did. And now traditional finance and traditional entities like OFAC are coming in and trying to sort of police this. There's this sense of this, this wasn't how it was meant to be. We were meant to create this new world of finance. And now suddenly the old TradFi people are coming in and trying to sort of push their weight around. It, it's hard to put a finger on it. It's hard to kind of really quantify it. But I just feel in the DNA and the philosophy of the community, there's a, in some cases, an active pushback. In other places, there's just a sense of unease about that. I don't know. Maybe I'm going out on a limb there. No, I, I, think it's, I think it's a really interesting moment. And the torna tornado cash has come to um, personify, if you will, this that that moment in many respects, the questions around it. And it seems to me that we're needing to thread a needle, right? To ensure that lawful actors have access to tools. You know, look, if we're going to do more and more transactions within an open financial system, people are going to need privacy and they're going to need privacy enhancing tools. But at the same time, North Korea cannot launder a billion dollars of stolen funds through these tools. Yeah. So how do you stop North Korea cyber criminals? And yet, um, you know, enable lawful users. And I think that's going to be the question of our time in this space, to be sure. I really think you're right. I think, and I think money laundering is sort of the altar on which this stuff is going to get sacrificed potentially. It's like, you know, there are people in the crypto community who, for, this, will, for the sake of privacy, will tolerate laundering of half a billion dollars worth of money by one of the world's most dangerous regimes. They're just like, well, that's the cost of privacy. That's a, that's a really interesting uh, debate to have. It'll be interesting to see how this legal action goes forward. There's various sort of crypto entities involved and individuals involved in this legal action against the US Treasury around Tornado Cash and the sanctioning of Tornado Cash. I, I, I need to do more work about how that legal process works. Um, but however it works out, however it shakes down, the debate is just fascinating.
It's absolutely fascinating. Um, I think we may have. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to ask you a question. That I think we've kind of gotten around the edges on, and, pro- and probably have answered in what is it's like a really fun, free flowing conversation, Jeff. So thank you. Um, I, I think what, what what's so interesting to me is like I, I did a TRM talks a few weeks ago um, with uh, Dr. Jung Pak, who's a deputy assistant uh, secretary at the at the U.S. State Department. Um, John Park, who's at Harvard, Nick Carlson, who's former FBI now at TRM. And there was a, a narrative that I think actually plays out in Lazarus Heist. And that is, you know, North Korea has always looked for ways to steal and launder funds. At one point, it was coal and, um, and, and mining. Um, I did a case when I was at DOJ involving uh, counterfeit cigarettes. And then they sort of happened upon Bitcoin. And they used it to launder funds. And that's honestly how I discovered a Bitcoin myself when I was at DOJ is, is watching North Korea cyber criminals use it to launder funds and just try to understand it. Um, but there's this other thing happening now. And it's a shift now, not just to using Bitcoin to launder, but to commit bank robbery at the speed of the internet in the DeFi ecosystem. But I feel like you're... Um, you know, the podcast and the book, and now it sounds like the next book... Is that story right? How because North Korea was attacking banks and Sony and the super interesting um, kind of ATM angle, which I'd love you to talk a little bit about. But now, and now we've moved into the crypto ecosystem. Can you talk about like I know that that was a very uh, you know, <laughs> rambling question, but would you talk a little bit about how you see that that progression? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think of the evolution, you might go back to somewhere like maybe 2012, 2013, prior to the Sony attacks. You're looking at fairly low level defacement attacks, denial of service attacks on websites. Then you have this what's called the Dark Soul campaign, the hacking campaign against South Korea, attributed to North Korea. They're targeting banks, they're targeting broadcasters, but it's still fairly low level stuff. It's very impactful. They managed to take some of that stuff offline for, for a short period of time. So you can see the tactics are staying the same, same, but the targets are going up a level. Then you get Sony. Sony was an incredible hacking campaign, but the aftermath of it from a sort of PR propaganda point of view was masterful. The, the, the way that was managed as a sort of hack and leak campaign was 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 really quite incredible. Then you start to get the targeting of banks. Obviously, Bangladesh Bank is the, the successful one. There's more than a dozen that, that I've put together, and there's other researchers who've lumped in even more. You know, you're talking about loads and loads and loads of banks, um, often in lesser developed countries, being targeted. Um, using mainly SWIFT network to transfer the money out the interbank transfer system. SWIFT puts in some controls um, to make SWIFT sort of harder to, to utilize. Banks obviously get the hang of the fact that they're going to be targeted and they start putting controls in around SWIFT. You also get, um, in terms of that physical sort of side of actually transferring money out of banks, um, you start to get these cash out campaigns, which you've referred to, where the hackers, North Korean hackers is the accusation, would break into a bank, compromise the ATM software, allowing them to basically trigger cash points around the world to sort of spew out money, to basically give money to whoever you know, the hackers Google. choose. Now, for that, you need a, a global set of, a lot of, of accomplices to go to the cash points with their cards, their ATMs with their cards, and withdraw the money. So that gets the North Koreans into these kind of really interesting collaborations, not just with cyber criminals, but with organized crime and street-level money laundering. There's two things happen, I think, as a result of that. Firstly, the U.S. Secret Service um, starts to do some work around that, starts to penetrate those networks of cash outs of ATM raids. Um, I've done an interview with a book with the US Secret Service um, who tell this fascinating story about how they sort of got into those gangs and particularly the North Koreans' accomplices. So that gets harder doing the ATM stuff. Um, it's also physical. You've got dudes running around with physical money in the world. It's, it's not particularly easy to get that money reconciled. And then the third thing that happens is COVID, which brings a lot of international trade to a halt, obviously most international trade, but also those money laundering networks, those money mules, that street level stuff starts to grind to a halt. All of that adds up to a sort of shift into crypto. You then obviously get the crypto value boom that happens in sort of 19, 2021. Um, uh, so that's of interest as well because there's money sloshing through it. So all of this is leading up to the North Koreans is the allegation, looking at crypto and thinking this solves a lot of our problems. It's international, it's borderless and seamless, it's digital so we can do it without these accomplices. You know, suddenly it starts to make a lot of sense. And you can look back at WannaCry as being this sort of test run of, of of laundering using crypto and of, of utilizing crypto networks. And then suddenly after 2017, it's like, right, okay, now we know how it works. And the next few years are just an evolution building up, as we say so far, building up to the Ronin Bridge Axie Infinity theft of 600 million 
but who knows even by the time this podcast goes out we might have a bigger one than that That, that's an incredible i I love that um explanation and it's just the history is so important to understand and and that movement and COVID did play such a role in sort of creating that isolation and then that that need to move to a digital space yeah Um, really really extraordinary and then this is amazing targeting, which I know that doctors Pack and Park talked about as well, of targeting the actual crypto industry itself and trying to sort of penetrate this industry and infiltrate it effectively with, you know, not fake employees. They're real employees doing real work, but but the, the employers don't know they're hiring a North Korean coder. And that, that whole sort of infiltration exercise was, again, was, was super fascinating. They really doubled down. The allegation is they've really doubled down on, on crypto. From yeah, all, from all sides. The, the IT worker piece is, is, is really extraordinary there's so many facets to this um to that end um we did have a lot of discussion in that trm talks with um dr pack and and, and dr park on um on mitigation as you're sort of doing your research um what are you sort of seeing in that space i mean interestingly even uh let's say last week the u.s justice department added a cyber section within the national security division of uh the justice department um seemingly um, trying to answer this move to a digital battlefield from that sort of counterterrorism posture that we've been in for so long. But um, that's happening globally. Um, what, what are you seeing? Um, and I love your journalistic lens. I hear a lot from, from you know, government officials. This is what we're doing. But I'd love sort of like to, to get a sense of whether it's working in your, in your mind. Uh, it's really interesting. And I, I do get asked about this occasionally. And the sort of direct answer is I'm not part of the sort of defense mechanism. Sure. So I cover the I cover the wrongdoing and the sort of investigation. Yeah. Um, I do think there's been positive strides. Um, I think that partly motivated by things like FTX, which is obviously unconnected with this, but it's still sure. in the crypto space. There's this growing sense of you know a need for regulation, and I think the crypto industry, as I say, has this DNA, this kind of soul that says, well, actually, we're meant to be radical, we're meant to be new, we're meant to be outside traditional finance, but they risk losing the battle for confidence and trust from users if this stuff keeps happening. The more those headlines come around, the more FTX type headlines come around, the less trust there will be from people in crypto. So crypto has this battle to win. So that's positive news. Um, Obviously, there's companies like TRM Labs and and, and various other of of your competitors and so on who are doing sort of the tracing work around this and trying to sort of, that feeds into the sort of cementing of regulation and legislation around it. And I do think lawmakers and, and governments and law enforcement are, are getting more clued up on this. Um, it's still difficult. It still involves a lot of uh, learning and learning fast and a lot of collaboration and cooperation. But I do get the sense that the time when you had to explain crypto to people and explain that it mattered and explain there were big things going on, those days are, I hope, luckily behind us. And now the question is, well, okay, tell me what to do. What's, what's, what's the smart way of moving? So you sort of won the battle for acknowledgement of it. Now the battle is for sort of implementation, I suppose. Really, really fantastic. Thank you. Uh, last question. Um, what's next? Uh, what's next for you? Uh, you've referenced your, your new book uh, a few times. Would love to kind of hear a little bit more about that work. But then also what would, you know, from, from, you know, seeing this progression of sophistication that we've sort of been talking about for, for a little while, what's next from North Korea? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, for me personally, so I've, I've written a book. It's going to be called Rinsed. And it's going to be out in June next year. Uh, I've submitted it last Saturday. Um, oh, congratulations. That's exciting. Yeah, big, big weight off my mind, but yeah. it, it takes a year apparently to print a book. I don't know wow. Um, well, I do know why. There's a lot of work to do in yeah. terms of getting it legal and so on. That book is going to detail how technology has changed the world of money laundering. And what's brilliant about that is it's not just cybercrime. I'm looking at it's not just North Korea. I'm looking also at cartel drug dealing, prostitution, child sexual abuse, global fraud. That's all filtering into this technologically enabled money laundering system. You know, it's, it's a sort of sluice gate through which all this stuff uh, runs, basically. So that's been super fascinating. I'm looking forward to kind of just looking at different types of crime beyond just cyber crime. It's been a really fascinating thing to do to look at where all the money sort of ends up because it's, as I say, it's the conduit point through which all of this stuff uh, runs. In terms of North Korea and kind of where that goes next, I mean, it's just a fascinating thing that they just end up, the North Koreans for some reason, end up in situations that are sort of globally significant, globally headline making. And I don't think the North Koreans sort of set out to do that. They just seem to do, they, they just seem to do these jobs that have big scale, big ambition and then hit the headlines. And I do sometimes wonder how that's sort of regarded within Pyongyang of, of what is being reported. Who, we hit, who, who do we work with? 
There was an Instagram influencer. Why did we get involved with him? I think sometimes a bit of uh, maybe surprise at that. Where this goes next, we have this entire new world of finance. And what's interesting, the big thing about the NFTs and non-fungible tokens is it's, I think it's probably the first of application of blockchain technology beyond crypto that we've really had. And suddenly it's exposed this whole new world of finance and value, value exchange. That is hugely important, not just for North Korea cyber criminals, but for cyber criminals in general, because it's poorly regulated, uh, it's global, it's frenetic, it's everything you want as a crime group and as a money laundering industry. You know, there's new areas of technology. So I suspect we're going to see the North Koreans and others pushing firmly into things like NFTs and then whatever development blockchain wise is, is, is coming thereafter. So, and, you know, and, and the mining space is super interesting as well. I think we need to keep an eye on mining and how that feeds into all of this because with mining, if you can fund mining, it's fresh money. It's, it's literally yeah. like you own the printing press. Um, I, I need to do a bit more work on that, but I think that's really worth uh, keeping an eye on. It's, it's a fascinating topic. And, you know, I talk to regulators um, frequently who will say that this is the number one issue on their mind, certainly when it comes to the crypto space, because um, it's not just fraud, it's not just financial crime, but that the funds are being used for weapons proliferation and destabilizing activity. And it's um, so it, it has that it's that intersection right between money laundering and national security. Um, yeah. I think a, a, that, that regulators are, are, are constantly thinking about today. Mm-hmm. Um, really amazing that you, you've, you've dedicated your career to this. It's, it's extraordinary stuff. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's, it's, um, it's endlessly fascinating. I think one of the things that interests me about sort of organized crime and technology generally is this idea. I, I, we watch Stranger Things, that Netflix series, Stranger sure. Things. You have, the, you have the netherworld in Stranger Things, the, the below world, which is sort of a mirror image of this you know, white picket fence US town but dark and creepy and stuff, but it still functions sort of in the way. And that's what I find fascinating about organized crime is, is it's, it, it, it's an organized crime. It's a bureaucracy. It's a business. How do you make a business run when you have none of the sort of legal and governmental abilities and assurances that you do in, in normal organizations? How do you get trust? How do you build trust in an, in an organization where everybody's a crook? I find those networks and that, 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 that whole way of working, that whole underworld type of thing, super, super fascinating. It's a real privilege to be able to cover it. Amazing. I, uh, I, I read recently that they're opening up the, uh, the play on the West End late yes. this year of Stranger Things. So maybe you'll come back on and you'll review it for me. I think that would be, uh, <laughs> that, that would be awesome. Anyway, Jeff, thank you so much for, for joining me for TRM Talks. Uh, really great conversation and look forward to continuing it. Thanks, Ali. I really appreciate it. I've had great fun. Thank you.